we've got uh, brand new people in decision-making roles in the mm. government mm. who don't necessarily have the uh, executive experience of aviation, but nor do they know how to deal with this new technology coming out of like Silicon Valley. Mm. You know, these are really IT people wanting to fly. They're not aviators wanting to fly. That's a very big difference. But I was invited again to be a speaker, which is such a nice thing, and to talk on um, an inclusion panel, um, talking about getting more of the underrepresented groups involved in the drone industry. Uh, and that's some, a cause that's really dear to my heart, so how could I say no? Uh, and Jason Sanzuzzi does a great job in this sphere, and that's who, who asked me. Um, but I first came to Vegas to a conference in 2017, um, into drone and didn't know what to expect and totally loved it because the drone industry has attracted particular personality types, a lot of people who are really curious mm -hmm. and love new things and can see potential. Um, yeah, so got on like a house on fire and now have this like a great meetup of friends as well as learning and socialising. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I... I echo that. Um, what I'm finding, I come from an aviation background, so what I'm finding is that this particular audience is very different than historical aviation audience. There's a heavy IT element here, so they're developing very quickly, faster than we can make the rules, faster than we understand what the performance requirements for safety standards need to look like, because each time we think we're almost there they've created something new already yeah so my goal here is to <clears throat> try and bring some of that historic uh, we call it CDM collaborative decision making that has been very successful in traditional aviation and bring that to this audience to help them understand how they can achieve some massive value by sharing their data right now it's very new and there's a fear of the unknown, right? They don't really feel comfortable sharing their data with other operators. You know, they're, they're in a competitive environment. They want ROI. I remember a time, because I've been around for a minute, <laughs> when the airlines felt the same way, where they didn't want to share their information with one another because they were worried about uh, competitive loss. You know, don't see where my market is or how many yeah. times I'm flying there. And back in the early 90s, we created something called collaborative decision making. And it was a grassroots way for us to try and figure out how to solve some of the more operational tactical problems. At that time, I was an aircraft dispatcher. Fast forward to today, where the airlines are sharing a lot of information and they have a lot of value from that shared information because it gives them uh, a sense of confidence in the system state, which they wouldn't have had without knowing what everyone else is doing. Mm. So I'm hoping that I can start bringing that philosophy, those principles of CDM to this audience to help them recognize that once we're, we, we start operating and we start sharing that information with one another, there will be an opportunity to aggregate and get some new learning out of that. We're calling it meaningful intelligence. And, and I think that they would find um, a lot of benefit in being able to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons that I'm here. You just reminded me of the benefit of longevity of experience and having seen how it was mm -hmm. and then how it changed. Most and, definitely. And I just think there's not enough mentoring that goes on generally in aviation generally. And during COVID, we lost so much knowledge and experience of so many pilots retired or they might have gone off, you know, they were made redundant and then they left the industry. They haven't come back. Agreed. I think we've had a huge loss of knowledge I and mean, that's not a drone industry comment. That's a, that's a crude aviation observation so yeah I think we need in a lot of industries better ways to set up mentoring 
that also recognises and values the mentors more. It's win-win for everyone, yeah. but some of the mentoring schemes that I've seen presume that the mentors have heaps of time and money and energy just to gift away. So we need better systems, which is kind of digressing. But you just reminded me of yeah. that when you talked about how it was to how it is now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would also, I'd also offer that that applies to government as well. We've lost a significant bit of corporate knowledge that we really need to enable this, this new domain. And it's different this time. We can't actually use the same processes and procedures and thought, you know, thinking processes mm. that we used mm. in the past with traditional aviation because this is not traditional aviation anymore. Mm. So we've got this, this weird mix of a lot of folks have retired. We've got uh, brand new people in decision-making roles in the mm. government mm. who don't necessarily have the uh, executive experience of aviation, but nor do they know how to deal with this new technology coming out of like Silicon Valley. Mm. You know, these are really IT people wanting to fly. They're not aviators wanting to fly. That's a very big difference. Mm. So I think that um, training, mentoring is applicable uh, across many of the decision makers that we have today. Mm. That's, a, that's a really good point. Mm. But it's kind of frustrating too because on the other hand we've got crude aviation who often, and I know this isn't just an Australian thing, actually they, they just want the drone industry really to go away. Yeah. You know, they feel threatened by it or it's like toys. I mean, I had someone say to me in a forum the other day, well, I'm a real pilot. Yes, um, I've heard that one too. Which I don't have a problem, you know, like, yeah, you've spent more than 100000 At the moment in Australia, anyway, it costs more than $100,000 to get your commercial mm -hmm. aviation licence, you know, to get your IRX and, and whatever else. So I'm not going to compare that with going down to your local shop and spending a couple of thousand dollars on a drone. But um, the arrogance has at times been hard to love and our regulations, because Australian regulations were like the first regulations in the world, the downside is that they have not evolved how they should and now we have the leading trainers will argue about the meaning of the different details mm -hmm. and that's a total failure. That's a total failure when people cannot pick up a document, a one page. We should be able to summarise our sub 2kg drone rules on one page, simple English, A4. You know, for us, we still can't fly at night. You don't fly at night. You don't fly over the top of people. You don't fly within 30 metres of people and you don't ever fly near airborne aircraft with people in it. Bam. And if you do that, safety's fine, you know. It covers nearly every other aspect that they go into. They've got a whole thesis on it, and it's written in such convoluted waffle that people can't, and even the best people who've studied it and whatever, still argue about the meaning of the laws when really all it is is safety and thinking safety and flying safety. So our laws really need binning, and we need to start from scratch. I love what you're bringing up here. So what you're describing is an element of what we're calling advanced air mobility meaningful intelligence. We're using advanced air mobility as an umbrella for all things uncrewed. But the meaningful intelligence part is to address a challenge that you're just describing. We started out this industry where there was no data, right? And now we've got so much, so much data out there Every time somebody gets $5 in their pocket, they do some research and then they put it up on the internet. Look at the great <laughs> things that I've done. And it's great for them. They have done a very specific thing. They've looked at a problem through their own lens and they've provided a solution to that specific problem. But then you and I, all, any of us, we see this, we search for some solutions to our drone problems and we come across that research and it doesn't resonate with us. It's not written in a way that's meaningful for us. And we would have to translate or dig way down because like you say, it appears convoluted because we weren't there 
So we don't understand the nuances, we don't understand the assumptions, and that makes it really hard to find anything meaningful. So what happens? Well, there's another person, he's got a decision, he or she has a decision to make, they've got another $5, and it's so hard trying to sift through the noise to find something useful to build off of, what do they do? They just go off and do their own thing. They recreate that wheel again. Mm, and this happens mm. over and over and over. So what does that do? Now we have multitudes of inputs onto the internet about that same problem space that are all speaking differently. You're talking about the same things, but there are different assumptions behind them. And it makes for our government decision makers a very, very difficult time to have confidence in making a decision. Mm. Because there's a lot of validation that needs to happen to sift through all of that noise. We're going to try and fix that. Mm. Um, MITRE, uh, where I work, we're a federally funded research and development center. So our mission is whole of government, whole of uh, system. Safety, efficiency, security. What we're going to try and do is we're tr going to try and wrap our arms around all of this information, all of this disassociated information, pull it together, normalize it, do some mining to find out what have we actually learned that we can't find. Because there's probably solutions out there that we haven't been able to get to mm. through all the noise. Put those out there. And then start fusing some of this in different ways and you know, mix it up and see if there is new learning that can come out of all of it. And well, one of the things we need to do too, I think, is share more on drone rules and regulations between different countries. Because what Europe yes. has been able to do, for example, is a classic. They don't treat commercial operators different to recreational. Hallelujah. You know? Because so many, and then there's people arguing about whether if they put a photo on a YouTube channel, whether that's commercial or not. Well, who cares? Because if you're flying a drone, you've got to fly it safely. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter whether you're doing it for work or for fun, There's, does it? You know, it makes no difference and it shouldn't make any difference. And, and if you're doing particular operations, then obviously you might need training and you might need to have insurance. But that doesn't mean it doesn't matter whether you're doing it for fun or for work. It's still the same. So um, the way the Europeans have set that up, I think is beautiful, particularly relevant to drones because so many people start just for fun mm -hmm. and then it turns into a business. Or they flew for fun and then someone wants to buy what they created. Mm -hmm. So at the time it wasn't commercial, but then someone wants it later. You know, it's just dumb. We have, don't have it separate. Just have it all together. Um, so I think there's a lot to be learned. New Zealand, for example, has shielded operations. Mm -hmm. So between, tree, you know, you've got tall buildings or trees, they can fly below that height. Um, that's a no-brainer yeah. because if an aircraft it hits the drone, what's well, already hit the trees right. or the, or the house, houses or, or dwellings that are there. Um, so I think globally we need to share more and pick the best eyes out and adopt that. But at the moment what's happening, we're picking the worst out and so Australia now is adopting RID and they asked us about the network model. Well, most of the Australian content, con continent um, does not have any mobile phone coverage. Oh. All the closely settled fringes mm -hmm. do, capital cities do, but the majority of the content doesn't. continent doesn't, so the network model is <laughs> never going to work. Why did someone even mention that? Is the real disconnect between reality and um, what we needed. And a lot of that clearly is driven, in our case, by the um, flying taxi mob. Yeah. And I don't believe that's going to be a thing either. But you kind of get howled down if you dare to say that. But, you know, there's so many issues. And my main one is what happens if you're on uh, a, an airborne aircraft and one of the passengers has a fight <laughs> with someone else? Because on a crude passenger aircraft, you get unruly passengers. They've drunk too much. They've got issues, whatever. You've got staff there to deal with anything that happens. Right. Same as on trains, you know. And there's cameras and they can stop the train and whatever. But if you're airborne and you've got a problem with the people on there, nobody seems to be talking about this. So that's nobody seems to be talking about the threat of solar weather. And if you lose yeah. GPS and you're in one of these, well, personally, I like a pilot up the front with eyes 
to look out and go, oh, we've got no GPS, but I can see down there there's a road we can land on, you know, mm -hmm. as distinct from someone way wherever in a room watching the screen. Um, and sometimes I'm called a Luddite, but the thing is, you know, I went from black and white TV <laughs> with three channels and no remote yeah. to now teaching people how to fly drones, so don't ever tell me that I don't adapt, <laughs> you know. But people still want to tell me that, and I'm like, no, but some of these things that are proposed, driven by venture capitalists, yes. are not re realistic, you know. They're not environmentally friendly, the energy supply issue hasn't been sorted out. Yeah. You're, you're a whole lot of other right. things. And you're bringing uh, up why this is such a complicated space. That's exactly why we still have to do environmental studies to understand what the impacts of these are in environmentals. It, it's not just our, our air, it's noise. You know, there, there are a number of factors. Hmm. We still have to understand um, what we're going to do with those kinds of situations where if we have a, an urban air mobility mission with two people in an air taxi and they get in a fight, does anybody care when they get on the ground? They're both unconscious? I mean, I, I don't know. We haven't talked about these things. No, it's, it hasn't been discussed. And oh, oh, you can have cameras in there. Oh, that's great. But it doesn't help that person getting attacked when you, you know, 100 metres up or however, yeah. however high. Yeah, it's crazy. So what we've really. had to start doing is rethinking how we talk about, how we consider safety and security mm. in our NAS. But is it actually going to work? Because is it, is it going to be economic? Because at the moment, you can fly, go and fly a helicopter from A to B. Mm -hmm. So well, why aren't people? Well, they aren't because of cost and because of noise. People don't want helicopters mm -hmm. landing right next to their place of business or... or or their home, uh, you know, these things aren't going to be quiet either. People so, won't want them landing. I would not want one landing next to me. I would say that they're not going to be silent, but they won't be as loud. They won't, but they'll still be noisy. And I think noise pollution probably might be one of the next, and light pollution might be one of the next things. I mean, I live in the tropics. Here's, a, here's an example. And in the tropics, we don't need air conditioning for what at least six months of the year uh, which means if, if you have an open house if you have a really well designed house and you get a breeze through it but the problem with that is that you get light pollution and you get noise pollution mm -hmm. is, is really a thing mm -hmm. um, so if you want to live people live more environmentally friendly you're going to have to address these other issues um, anyway to segue a bit I was reminded this morning too of a new thing um, zoom cameras and privacy issue because CASA again have the two things. One was read, the other one was a privacy document. And privacy is not CASA's remit any more than it's the FAA's. Mm -hmm. um, but thermal cameras um, and zoom cameras, I think this is probably going to be the next um, nasty cat out of the bag for drone operators. Likely. And yeah. yeah because you saw this morning they were zooming in on people walking who didn't know they were being filmed and... 160 times. It was 160. Oh, really? 160 times. Wow, that was the... The magnification. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I didn't realise it was that. Yeah, but it's, I'm kind of thinking, if that was me, I probably wouldn't be that thrilled with um, being shown like that. You, you've got to, and as a professional photographer, you, I'm always thinking about what's that person going to think, you know? Am I portraying them in a good light? But 99% of drone operators don't have that background, so they're not thinking about the person that they're filming or taking photos of. Um, <laughs> Nor are they aviators, so they're not thinking about the safety implications no, of no, what their mission is doing. No, right. no and, this, and this brings me back to a panel I'm talking on tomorrow, which is on... Um, bringing in underrepresented groups and the elephant in the room in the drone industry, of course, is women because, it, yeah, in theory, um, we've got roughly 6% who are fully licensed and in theory, I think the US figure is now, I think, 6%, but I actually strongly doubt that in practical terms because I think a lot of the women who are fully licensed in Australia aren't actually flying they're doing admin and they might have the re they're holding the operator certificate so they're doing all the admin 
So they're not actually out in the visible role flying drones. Um, yeah, and it's never going to be 50-50, but... Uh, Why not? Uh, you can argue nature or nurture as long as you like, but it's the same reason we'll never have 50-50 uh, male-female nurses in hospitals. We have a long way to go, don't we? Well, I don't think... I do, I do think women... Again, nature and nurture, it's, it's a fact that women have children. It's the fact that mostly women are the primary caregivers. Often they want to take on that role. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're magically better suited. I think they learn to do it. But I think that's, that's the reality. And I think that's why we've plateaued in terms of women becoming CEOs, at least Australia has, and I think other countries, and, and MPs, members of parliament. Because most women, you can't have it all. You're going to have a full-on career <laughs> without children, or you can have kids and you make compromises mm -hmm. and, and I've in, in, in my career I have had to say no to so many things to put my family first and it's a constant it's stressful it is. and and it's why women end up not earning as much yeah. because yeah yeah and this is the reality it is the it, reality. it would be great if you live 10 lives and do everything mm -hmm. but you can't but you're only one person yeah you're only one person and it's the women who feel guilty if the kids are in childcare. mostly probably not the blokes that's right some might but mostly it would be the women who you know yeah. carrying the mental load of the organizing mm -hmm. and everything yeah i'm i'm very fortunate at my company because we have some very, very strong role models, women role models in our executive suites. They are fantastic and they have families and they're doing it all. But that hasn't been my experience. I've been in this industry now for 30 years and I was largely the only woman many times in meetings and was not, I had to fight twice as hard just to be heard and sometimes that still happens today, where um, I think you brought up the example earlier. Mm. Uh, I may, I may offer something to the group, and it kind of falls flat, and it won't be too long before someone else, another male, offers the same thing. Perhaps it's worded slightly differently, and it takes off. What a great idea! Yep. And when you have a a quiet conversation with them afterwards. Oh no, I didn't mean to do that. I, I must have not heard you. Whatever it is. I, I don't believe it's a thing. It's a thing. Let me tell you, it's a thing. And it's very hard and it takes extra energy. So think about the, the compilation of all of this, having to take that extra energy to be just heard, to be seen, while you are also carrying the personal load of family, whether you have children or you're a caregiver for your parents, whatever the situation is, that's two jobs, right? Two mm. full-time jobs that were not recognized really for either. So this whole new movie, the, the whole Barbie movie yeah. that just mm. came out, I've not seen it yet. So full transparency, I haven't seen it yet. But I'm thinking the messaging is probably along the lines of what we're talking about here, is we just assume a role and we assume a way of showing up. And when someone does show up differently, it's uncomfortable. And I, I really would rather not deal with that. And it takes us dub to double our effort to normalize that. I don't know as it's normalized, but I have been very fortunate where I work, we are very, our, our diversity programs are very strong and growing all the time. And there is a, a deliberate effort to recognize when those kinds of situations are happening and we address them. We talk about training. I would love to see more of that mind shift in how we train. It's not just buttonology but there's a culture that could be trained. 
and we could incorporate that into the curriculums that we're providing. Drones is a great example for, for, being, for having a platform to do that because drones are now touching so many different domains. Mm. So think about the, the widespread opportunity we would have to be able to affect change there. I think this is why we need um, more women training and more public speaking. And this is why I've actually written blog posts on <clears throat> what I wish I'd known when I started public speaking. So everywhere I go, I meet someone good. And, and, and I'll do it with men too, because there's a lot of quieter men or, they, you know, there might be introverts, which is a tip, there's a lot in the drone industry who, you know, they might be on the spectrum, they're neurodiverse, whatever, and mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not into big crowds and whatever, but they're fantastic and they should be up on the stage speaking. Yes. And so trying to encourage and give confidence um, to people so we've got a big diverse range. Look, and I've got nothing against Andrews, but there was an event a couple of years ago I was invited to speak at, and I kid you not, the first two speakers were called Andrew. It's like, ah, you know, can you not see <laughs> the problem here? There wasn't a single woman talking that whole day. There's all kinds of people, but Andrew, and I mean, I wouldn't want to go to a conference where all the speakers were called Fiona either, because I know <laughs> they're probably around my age, they're probably middle class, they're probably, you know, like, I want, to, I want different ideas. Yes. Yes. and challenging ideas because that's how things get better. So when I talk about this, and I will be talking about this on the panel, it's really important for me to make the point. It's not about women being better. It's about them thinking differently yes. and, and offering different points of view. And you mix it all up and you get a better result. And I learnt this, <coughs> excuse me, I learnt this at um, when I first started being invited to talk about drones in 2016, I talk on a multi-topic day, it'd be a very short talk, and then afterwards uh, men and women separately would come up and ask me questions, and it was like a script, it was surreal. I, I still can't believe this happened. The blokes would ask three questions all the same, and the women would ask three questions all the same, different questions. It was amazing, and sometimes in events I'll actually ask the audience, can you guess what these questions were? And they'll think, and, and usually they'll get it pretty right. And it, and it perfectly illustrates how differently they, they think, you know? It, it, I love yeah. that. I love that. And that is, our, that is our justification for diversity of thought, being able to bring people of all different backgrounds and expertise and yeah. domains. If you're not in transportation, I want to hear from you. What do you think about this? You're now in, what, you're a, a movie producer, you're a real estate agent, yep. you're a miner, whatever you are, you have a lens and you're using drones. I want to hear your, your narrative. I want to understand what it looks like through your lens so that as we're building these policies and these standards, there is a, an inclusive recognition that this is not a one-size-fits-all anymore. We are not pure aviation anymore. We have, we're, we're bleeding across so many yeah. different things and we can't do that alone. We need everyone to bring their lens to the table, right? Yeah. So that we can consider how we're characterizing the boundaries that we put around these things. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, isn't it? Like someone might be in mining and then they start flying the drone or, or, or they're right. a police officer and then they start flying a drone. So it's mixed. It's not like pure aviation for them. Mm -hmm. They aren't just a pilot full time. That's what they do, carting people or carting freight. It's a mixture. So, but the diversity is, is a really glaring thing. And I think if we are able to really genuinely lift the number of women involved and visible, not just out the back doing the admin roles, which are as essential, but the issue is they aren't seen roles. So they don't encourage more women in. Mm -hmm. So we need women in visible spaces. And as a photographer, obviously the photogenic things are the things that make it online and into print media and TV. So it's actually the person flying the drone. We've got the same problem in agriculture. They'll take 
bloke's out on the tractor and the woman might be in the office and she's as important yeah. to the business but she's surrounded by a messy office mm -hmm. so her picture doesn't make it into the paper or online. Yeah. So it doesn't help lift the profile of women because of the particular roles that women end up in. I completely yeah. agree. And, in, and another element of this is women are very good at being able to translate from one uh, context to another context. That's really my entire job is translating between operational and science. And uh, I've spent the last 20 years going between traffic management, you know, uh, air traffic controllers, dispatchers, and uh, engineers and scientists. Women have a much, I don't know, it's an ear for being able to recognize when there is a difference in translation, when mm. there are people talking past one another. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know if that is because of, uh, uh, perhaps we are more sensitive to not being understood, that we recognize when those things are happening with others. But if we uh, are also not paying attention to the translation gap between aviation and construction and mining and real estate and police, uh, uh, first responders, public safety, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Now, I would rather have um, you and I sitting in a room listening to um, Yes, and the development of requirements for some mission, what I don't care what it is, construction, mining, whatever it is, so that we would be able to identify where those seams are, where there is an assumption where you say risk and I say risk, and those that word means two very different things, and mm. no one picks up on that. But... I've experienced that women are more quickly adapting to picking up those gaps where those yeah. words have different meanings. And they can save a whole lot of work up front by identifying that yeah. and working to resolve those definitions that they can then be built on going forward. Yeah, yeah. rather than get to the end and realize it yes. was a problem at the start and have to redo the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, cutting to the chase. So communication. Um, is the thing. And I don't know, I think perhaps men hopefully are improving at communication. One of the interesting things I notice is in drone forums, which I'm fairly active in, because I find it a really good space for learning. And because as a trainer, I learn a lot about the problems people are having, the kind of information they're wanting, and the delivery, how, they, how they're wanting the info delivered um, as well. And you'll find... I'm re one of these days I'm going to set up a fake profile that is a man's because a lot of the moderators have different, not just the participants, the moderators have different standards for the men participating in the forum to the women. So the men can be blunt, and I'm blunt, but I have a woman's name. So if I was called Chris and I had a shadowy profile picture, they would presume I was a bloke. But because I'm a woman, I, I literally have been told, oh, you know, that's a bit blunt and la la. I've never seen any of the men and they'll be saying the same things as me. <laughs> it's back to the meeting thing of not being heard. This is totally double standards and I would love to actually set up this profile and then post the same messages and then go, look at these different responses I got to my two things saying the same thing. The double standards, and it's amongst women too. Women have standards for other women. They expect them to be kind and nice and, you know, not challenge or voice an opinion that doesn't go along with everyone else's. Women are perhaps more of a problem, actually, than, than the men are yeah. in this. Um, I see it again and again. And in the drone industry too, there are some queen bees who actually like being the only woman in the room and tread on the fingers of the other women trying to climb the ladder. That's a shame. 
but it's very subtly done because we women we have to use our smarts you know because we don't have the brawn yeah. so it can be very hard you you only ping this when you start to see a pattern of behavior mm-hmm. um and and particularly you know our drone industry is small the u.s drone industry is huge so you have much less of an issue here because <clears throat> there's just too many voices people can't get away with that kind of thing right but in other countries where there's a smaller drone industry, it is definitely a problem. Well, yeah. You let me know how I can help you. Because I, I, I have to think that unless we all stick together and help one another, lift one another up, we're going to continue to struggle in the same level that we're in. Because there's not going to be anyone else that's going to do it. No, no, that's it. We look to men to fix the issues, but really... Women are more than half the population, you know, by the time you get to 30. So if there's a problem, who should be fixing this? Like, why is it still a thing? It's still a thing because women aren't fixing it, really, ultimately, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, we can't be victims. We've got to fix it ourselves. And, And that might require rocking the boat and treading on a few toes somehow. But, you know, change requires rocking the boat otherwise we're just going to have the same staff it's going to go on because you you read stories of some of these aviators women in the 1920s they were amazing and you go they were doing that back then that's 100 years ago Mm -hmm. how come Mm -hmm. things haven't progressed that much change is hard it's mad yeah change is very hard but we're here and you and i are having this conversation Uh So we have made some progress. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, we have. To. How can people reach you if they would like to reach out? You are here, but you will be somewhere else eventually uh, when this show is over. Michelle, how can somebody reach out to you if they want to connect after maybe watching this or being inspired by this amazing chat you guys have had? What's the best way to reach you? I, I am on LinkedIn, so just search for my name, Michelle Duquette. Uh, I am at the MITRE Corporation, so uh, feel free, reach, reach out through LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to chat. Excellent. If you yeah. Know, how do we reach Yeah, you? I'd say the same thing, because LinkedIn is so undervalued, I think, and now finally there is a really, really good network of um, people in the drone industry and, and, and robotics and AI, machine learning, and a whole lot of tech industries who are on uh, LinkedIn, and you'll find people there that you won't find anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also have a website and whatnot, so if they Google my name, they'll they'll find my stuff. Yeah, Fiona Lake, and if they Google you, they will find you. They they will find me. Yeah, so so it's great. And mostly, I think what my work boils down to is helping people, give people confidence to speak up, to speak up and say what they're thinking. Say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Don't just think it. Because often when you say something in an event like this, people will come up later and go, oh, I'm glad you said that because I've been thinking it. It's like, please say it out loud. Yes, yes. Because you don't want to feel like you're the only one. Right. And when you do, to get the courage to go and say it out loud, you find other people think the same. Exactly. So it's encouraging people to take the courage to say it. And it's hard. It's not easy, but practice. Practice. That's right. Practice, yep. Isn't it? That's right. Thanks, ladies. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This was amazing. And uh, I'm so glad we had the time today to do this. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Absolutely. Thank you so much.